Some good worship, man. It's real good, man. Yeah. How's everybody doing? Yeah? Thursday night? Still lit. We're still live. That's, that's interesting. And we're still here. You know, the Lord hasn't come back yet. But I have a feeling it's soon. He said it's soon. So, you know, we wait. Uh, we, we are watchful. You know, you really got to be, we really have to take that to a literal sense these days, man. We got to be watchful, like he said. Jesus said to be watchful. Be the servant that's waiting, man, looking. Because if we're not, man, we're going to get weird, get caught off guard, get slipping, go to the left or to the right. We don't want to do that. Walk today in the strength and righteousness of the Lord, man. And if you're struggling tonight, that's good you're here because, you know, the word of God wants to encourage you. And, uh, and the Holy Spirit wants to edify you and, and speak to you and teach you. Uh, and, you know, and the thing is, man, is always when we come here to the men's ministry and, and, and we walk out, one, one thing I, I always want to say is make sure we leave here uh, not in our own righteousness. You know what I mean? In his righteousness. That's, that's the key, man. That's, the, that's sort of that's the secret, if you will. It's, it's not trying to live this walk in your righteousness we have to live it in his righteousness you know because our righteousness is as filthy rags that's what the bible says so it's not meant for us to accomplish this man it's for us to rest in the fact that jesus is the one who is who has paid it who is who is the victor who is the one supplying the power for us to be and so um so anyhow, man, and that's how we're going to keep going. That's how we're going to move on. If you walk out of here, you, then you're in trouble. <laughs> if you walk out of here in the Lord, then you're going to do all right for the night. You might even sleep good, uh, you know, and then tomorrow morning is a whole other day, you know, uh, one moment at a time. So guys, we're still going through Genesis. I, I, so I'm finally putting in our church bulletin here on Sundays an announcement for uh, the Bible study. I never do that. I never put, you know, ministries, they do the, the announce their ministry. I'm going to announce the men's ministry. I'm just not putting what book we're in because I'm afraid the last time I did an announcement, we were probably in Genesis and I don't want anybody to be like, they're still in Genesis, man. Like, you know, I, I probably put an announcement in probably about four or five, four years ago, maybe. And honestly, what are we? I think we're going, we're pushing. Oscar, where are we at, man? Three and a half Three and a half years now, 2015. Man, what were we, I was about nine years old then, I think. <laughs> Jeez, man, that's some. That, that's putting in some work. Uh, I almost feel like I want to just redo Genesis again. It's been so long, Genesis one. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you know, but but it's good. It's has been good. Uh, I Genesis is the beginning. It's the foundation. Uh, our school is going where our Bible department this coming year is going to be doing Genesis. And um, uh, the emphasis is that the first 11 chapters of Genesis is the foundation for everything. It's the foundation for the scripture. It's the foundation for who we are. If you're really looking at it, as we're looking at it, as you really dig into it, you'll see that everything in here is, talks about, it sets the, the, the ground for everything, man. So let's pray, man, as we get into it. We're in Genesis chapter 43 tonight. Uh, and I'm going to start off at verse 8. That's where we left off, right? And uh, let's see what the Lord might uh, want to say to us tonight through the word. So, Father, we thank you for uh, tonight. We thank you for calling us here. And, Lord, we're here. We want to receive from you through the word, uh, your word, the living word. And Lord, we know there's, we want to receive it by the power of your Holy Spirit. Our, some of our minds are a little distracted right now. Some of us are, um, we're just maybe all over the place. Lord, we want to, that calm. We pray for that peace that we could hear from you tonight by reading your word. And that we would go into a deeper fellowship with you. That we would walk out knowing and experiencing fellowship with you. And that's our prayer tonight, Lord to grow close to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, man. So, ch so chapter 43, verse 8 
is, is where we're picking up on this whole thing. And last time we were together, we talked about the famine, kind of a heavy topic, kind of relative to what we're all, what we have experienced and things that we have gone through, the famine, the tribulation, the trials of our own lives, how that affects us and how God uses fa famine and trial. And, and that's something that, man, you got to write that on your hearts uh, because we're all going to experience trouble and famine, tribulation at some point. And so it was really interesting to see how God is using this famine in the lives of these guys here, Judah, down to his family, the, the brothers, down to Joseph, this whole thing. And what's interesting to me is we're coming to that point where now Joseph, it's, we're getting there at least to where Joseph is going to be exposed and, and God's gonna reveal who he really is to his family. But notice all the, the trouble that comes before it, you know what I mean? All the different trial and all the different uh, emotional things and spiritual battles they're going through. And you know, it's set up this way in the Bible for a reason. Because God wants us to see that, that when, things, when he's doing things in our lives, when he's, when he's moving in our lives, that oftentimes trouble is a little bit of the, is right there in the beginning. Famine, change, trial. It's usually in the beginning. And tonight is going to be interesting because there's another part of our, of our journey that has to happen before God begins to be able to move, be able to do the, the miracle, the unthinkable, to be able to deliver, to be able to save. There's something major that has to happen in every one of our lives. And we're going to read about that tonight. And so put your mind set on that. If, if, if we're wondering, man, Lord, really, I want to be used by you. I want to be delivered. I want to be effective for the ministry. I want to be used by you in these last days. Then turn your ear towards what God might say tonight, because there's something here that we're going to see happen in, in the lives of, of Israel and all of his family that is groundbreaking. And it has to happen to every one of us. Let's start here at verse 8. It says, And Judah said unto Israel, his father, Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and thou, and also our little ones. Stop for a moment. Think, look at what he's saying. Send the lad with me, that we may live, all of us, but family. The lad, who's the lad? Benjamin. Send Benjamin with me, that we might live. So here's this quick, dire presentation of their current situation. The lad in our verse we just read equals life. You see that? Here's this presentation. Benjamin, the lad, our brother, equals life, equals sustenance, equals deliverance, equals all these other things that are going to set us free. Benjamin becomes the object within a decision here. That's what we're reading. That has to be made by Jacob in order to sustain their survival. Benjamin is the object of this decision. And not only just to sustain their survival, but to accomplish God's will. So if I had to put this verse in like a little blueprint, I had to piece it all out and see it real intricately, you know, through the eyes of the lens of the matrix type stuff. This would be a decision that equals life or death. Let's piece it out. That's the blueprint of this verse. That's what we're seeing. The lad equals life or death. So the decision here, let, let's, we got to get into that for a minute. Because why would God put us, put Jacob or, and Judah and Jacob and his family in a position where he has to make a decision that affects life or death? Does that sound like something God does? Does that sound like, does that sound like the God we serve today? Does God put us in a decision, in a place where we have to make a decision uh, and the result of that decision is either life or death? Absolutely God does that today. 
And as a matter of fact, God often does that on a daily basis for every one of us. And Jesus was the one who emphasized, hey, deny yourself. Take up your cross daily. There's daily death that has to happen with every single one of us. But the question for us, not for Judah here, or uh, not for Israel, I'm sorry. The question for us is what is your object of decision making? What is the object in your life that God has on your altar right now that you have to decide? And whatever this decision is, it's going to equal spiritual life and spiritual death for you. What is that for you? What is that for me? We know what it is for, for Israel. It's Benjamin. He's been so locked in and fixated on Benjamin that he's even risking the lives of the rest of his family because of it. Benjamin is his, his, his joy, his pride. It's his only son by who? His wife, who is it? Rachel, the one he what? Love, not the ugly one, the pretty one. I don't blame the brother. He's probably the only good looking kid left, you know? And, and, it's, and he's holding on to Benjamin. He's saying, no man, I am not gonna let him go, even if it risks death for my family. And that's kind of radical, man. But let me ask you guys a question. And I have to ask myself this too. Have we done the same thing? Have we held on to something so tight that we knew it would risk spiritual death for our family and us as well? Uh, really interesting. How God does the same thing, man. How many Benjamins have you had? You know? Maybe, ben maybe the Benjamin is your idol, man. <laughs> you know? What is it? And what do we have to surrender? What do we have to surrender? See, man, a, a big part of being delivered, a big part of being introduced to God's full plan for your life and being a big part of walking in God's plan for your life is surrendering. And I'm not just talking about surrendering you because you might be like, I surrendered, bro. I stopped smoking and drinking and all that stuff. I stopped doing this. I stopped breakdancing and all that. I stopped doing everything that was evil and wicked, you know. Uh, okay, that's cool. You surrendered you. But guess what, man? There's a ton of other things inside you. That God, from the day that we received the Lord and we said, Lord, uh, I want to receive you. I'm walking down the thing or whatever. Uh, and that day was great because you were delivered and you now were given, granted access to the kingdom of God. But what was started that day in every single one of us now was a, a process that God says, okay, now I'm going to transform you and I'm going to renew your mind by changing you. And the only way I could change you and some of us, you look at each other, some of you need a lot of change, man. <laughs> okay, some, you, can, you know who needs a little bit more change, <laughs> you know. When you're sitting at the table, oh, that brother, <laughs> it's going to take several years for this guy. And, but here's the thing. God knows the real change that has to take place. He knows, he knows what it is we're holding so dear to that we don't want to let go. And by us not letting go, it's hindering his power, his victory, and his will for our lives. So I ask you, what is God telling you to surrender now? What is he saying to you? I got you. I know that. You said, Lord, I need you. Yes, you did. I heard you. I heard that. And because you said that, I, I've forgiven you. But now I want to be powerful in your life. Now I want to move in your life in such a way that you now are going to bring me glory. You're going to save people. You're going to minister to people. You're going you're gonna to change. And, and he's saying, though, what is it now in you? Who's your Benjamin? What is it that God is saying that you're still holding on to that's on the balance that is life and death for you? Spiritual life and spiritual death. That's the thing we have to remember. Jesus said, you know, you can't serve two masters. You can't. And we know that the Bible also tells us that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. 
So you can't have two things going on. You can't say, oh, you know, man, uh, yeah, uh, I'll hold on to this a little bit. It's my own little secret thing. I'm not hurting anybody. You know what I mean? I, I'm not affecting anybody. It's just me who's affected, you know? Well, no, you're wrong. You, you are affecting someone else. You're affecting God working in your life. That's who you're affecting. And that should be the only person you should be concerned about. Not everybody else. But you might say, well, you know, it's my own thing, man. It's my own closet, you know, my, my drawer of goodies, you know. And, and you know what? If God is looking at you saying, listen, <clears throat> trust and believe in me to, to deliver you, to, to take this from you. I always have mentioned here, I always love this quote by, uh, 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 I have so many authors running through my head. Who, who wrote Let Go? Fenelon. What's his first name? Anybody know Fenelon? No, no, no. Anyhow, not important. Fenelon, the Let Go book. He says, God is the great physician. And the great physician is going to take the, sur the surgical knife and he's going to only carve out uh, what's living in you. And that's why it hurts because it's still living in you. He's not going to go and get sloppy and start poking around at your back and your legs and stuff because he's already worked on those things. He's going to carve out what's alive and it's going to hurt. So I ask you tonight, what hurts right now? What is it that, that you're feeling the pressure of, of having to stop? or having to change, or having to do. And you know the Lord's asking you to do this, but you're just like, oh man. And it hurts a little bit. But see, we have to trust in the great physician. And we have to believe that he's only doing this for our good. That I'm only having to give up the Benjamin, my Benjamin, my loved one, my only remaining son from my loving wife, I really have to give him up? I really have to, to, to do this? And can you imagine? He's thinking, God, you're not fair. You took my first son from me, and now you want to take, uh, take Benjamin? You want to take them both from me? And we've done that, haven't we? God, this isn't fair. You want all this from me? You want me to do this, this, and this? And this but that's my hot rod, God. You don't even know. You know? But, and Lord, you want to change that and change this? No. And you get that way sometimes. We can get that way. Lord, you want my mind too? You, you want my, or you want my physical body too? You want my, my but I hurt. <laughs> uh, this hurts. And the Lord says, yeah. I, I want you to endure. So we are opening up our reading tonight with this good understanding that Israel this has been all about Israel. This has been about something he's been holding on to. And now God, thank God, he brings us to, brings Israel to a point of exhaustion, of finally just being done. And maybe some of you guys are there tonight. You're done, man. You don't need, you're done and you don't even know what you're done from. You just know you're done. You're exhausted and you don't even know why you're exhausted. You're just exhausted. <laughs> and tonight, maybe you're going to hear that this exhaustion you're feeling, this feeling of just being done, is because God has been trying to reveal your Benjamin. And he's ready to deliver you. Verse 9, <clears throat> Judah speaking here. I will be surety for him of my hand shall thou require him if I bring him not unto thee and set him before thee then let me bear the blame forever now we already know that there was another son who tried to do this right didn't work out so <clears throat> here we have another plea coming from though now Judah and Judah saying listen <clears throat> I'll take the blame like, like his blood is on my hand uh, dad I swear if, if I don't if I mess up then you can blame me forever now that sounds kind of weird it sounds kind of shady like okay yeah that, that's really going to work <clears throat> 
But apparently, there was something that was stated in here that Israel needed to hear. See, he needed to hear this sort of like uh, this fallback type thing. Okay, I have somebody to blame if something goes wrong. Judah, if, if you don't come back with Benjamin, I could blame you forever. <laughs> you, you will be my target. You will be my dart practice. Okay. But look at what he says next in verse 10. This is interesting. For except we had lingered, surely now we had returned this second time. That's an interesting verse, even though it sounds really weird in the King James. Okay. Uh, it, in other words, some of your Bibles might read it simple. It might say, if we didn't waste all this time, we could have made two trips. Maybe your translation might be a little bit more clear on that. Basically what he's saying, look, <clears throat> look, dad, if we didn't waste all this time sitting around you over there worshiping Benjamin or whatever, we could have already made two trips down to Egypt and come back twice with food to be alive. Dad, if you only hadn't procrastinated, if you only hadn't wasted your time, there is such a thing, guys, as spiritual procrastination. And it brings misery to the believer. It does. It brings distress, doubt, fear, frustration. Spiritual procrastination is is an is a poison well i'm just waiting for the lord to deliver me i'm just gonna wait for god i mean you know i hate you but i'm waiting for the lord to you know open that door i hate the situation i'm in right now i know god doesn't want me to be here but you know i don't have another job so i'm just gonna wait till you know he provides but i hate being here you know, some of you guys know my job here in the church, in the school. I deal with the employment side of things here as well. It's part of what I do. And I'll tell you what, I have had the opportunity to have many exit interviews with a lot of angry Christians and a lot of upset people. And I asked myself, man, you know, we're all believers and stuff. We work in the church. Why would people be so angry, <laughs> you know, on their release or whatever, you know? Especially when we're all sitting there going, well, I believe in God for great things and great things he has done and he's going to provide. But they leave so angry, frustrated. And just you see this this kind of split in their eyes, man. Well, you know what I've learned what it is? It's because they procrastinated for some reason or another. They were afraid to make a decision. They were maybe scared. Maybe they felt if I make a decision, I don't have another job and I won't get paid and I need to make money. You know, that's a natural fear. Uh, and, but see, as Christians, we kind of turn that around. And instead of blaming ourselves and saying we're just procrastinating, we kind of say, well, God hasn't said to do anything yet. Oh, okay. So you think God just wants you to be miserable then. That's what you think. You, you think I'm not going to make a move. I'm not going to make a change in my life until God moves me, takes me up by my head, and places me somewhere. Well, then I ask you the question, where is your faith? Where, where is your faith? Where is your trust? See, but those types of things, when our faith is challenged and our trust is challenged, then we, we don't do anything. We, we sometimes get reclusive. And we're afraid to make a move. And the whole time, all you're doing is allowing for bitterness to store up and you're allowing the enemy to get in there and you're so confused that by this time you're saying well it's God it's God's fault <laughs> he's the one not doing anything he's the one who must have me here for a reason he must have me in this situation no listen we know what we need to do okay Israel knew what he had to do he knew he had to send Benjamin from the beginning but he waited he didn't want to. And Judah's calling him out on it. We could have handled this a long time ago. And I say to the Christian tonight who was in this place of, of just procrastinating, knowing what you're supposed to do, but you're waiting for the lightning bolt to spell it out in the sky and, and then it to hit the tree and then the squirrel on the tree to die and, and him to lay on the ground and a little thing to come out of his stomach that says, this is a message from God. 
It may not happen that way, man. I hate to tell you. I looked for the stars too. I stared at them for hours. I thought a little bug was talking to me. I thought, you know how there's a, the passage where the donkey turned around and talked to what's his name? I thought I heard many animals. I'm like, is this it? Is this the message from God? Is he talking to me now? Is this the way it's going to come? The divine revelation? Well, I, I hate, I, Lord, forgive me because it's here. The divine, he's already told me what to do. He's already told me where to go and what to say. He's already told me how to live. So why am I over there listening to butterflies? What, what are they going to tell me? You know what I mean? Uh, we wait for these signs. We wait for something else maybe is going to come. Maybe, maybe the, the famine's going to change, uh, Israel thought. Maybe Israel thought that the famine would stop. And so he wouldn't have to do what God was telling him to do by sending Benjamin. Maybe he just thought something else would come about. We got to beware of spiritual procrastination because it hurts us. If God is calling you out, if God is calling you to change, if he's calling you to give something up, if he's calling you to make a move uh, and you know it, and the Bible tells you to trust in him, the Bible tells us that without faith we cannot please God, the Bible tells us uh, that we cannot trust in ourselves. The Bible tells us to deny the flesh. So what else do you need to hear? There it is. Oh, well, you don't understand, bro. I got a lot at stake here. Well, you know what? Judah pointed, he had his whole family at stake. Eventually, you're going to have your whole family at stake. And God is still going to say, I still want you to do what you're supposed to do. <laughs> Eventually, your life will be at stake. You know? You'll be laying on the hospital bed there. Why did I wait so long? <laughs> Why did I do this for so long? I was supposed to give that up a long time ago. You know, why didn't I just stop, you know, drinking, you know, seven bottles of NyQuil before I went to bed? I knew there was something wrong with it. Why didn't I just stop? Now I'm in a hospital bed getting pumped out of NyQuil. You know what I mean? Like these things, why, why, why don't I stop? Why don't I just listen? Spiritual procrastination, we have to be careful. But like I mentioned, this is a very, this is a breaking point for, for Israel and it could be a breaking point for all of us. You have to get to a point when you're finally exhausted and where you're done. You're, you looked in the mirror in the morning and you said, that's gross. And you, and, you, and you looked at, and the Lord showed you your heart and you said, that's gross too. And, and you realize once again, that you're only a broken person. And you realize that you're not supposed to be the one that's accomplishing this Christian walk. Not you. And then you finally realize that God loved you the whole time. And that he wasn't out to hurt you at all. And he wasn't out to be vindictive towards you. He was just out to love you. And he just wants the best for you. That's it. And you tell God of all your needs and all of your wants and things. And you think he's withholding the good from you. And you end up realizing when you're finally exhausted and you finally have drained yourself of all of who you are, you finally say, man, what was I being blind? What was I so blinded by? You know, my flesh blinds me. And it kept me from seeing the goodness of God. And it kept me from seeing that God really wanted to perform a miracle in my life. He really did want to deliver me. He really wanted to set me free from myself again. And when you're finally to that point, if you're not there tonight, if you're not at that point, you'll get there. <laughs> and we'll be praying for you. <laughs> and, you know, and it'll, it'll feel weird. You'll feel lonely. You do. You feel lonely at times. Um, and sometimes you don't feel God. Actually, I don't feel God a lot of times. But I know he's there. I was, uh, did I share with you guys about the others? Maybe I did last week, huh? Those by faith who didn't see the promise, yet they were cut in two. And the Bible tells us that the world was not worthy of them. The ones who didn't see the promise, yet they still believed. Now look at what we have happening here in verse 11. <clears throat> and their father Israel said unto them, If it must be so now, take of the best fruits in the land, in your vessels and carry down the man a present 
a little balm, a little honey, spices and myrrh, little nuts and almonds. Verse 12, and take double money in your hand and the money that was brought again into the mouth of your sacks. Carry it again into your hand. Peradventure, it was an oversight, meaning maybe it was a mistake when he, they got the money back to you. He's saying, take it all. Take, maybe take all this. And I have a feeling while Israel was saying this, the next verse did not want to come out of his mouth. I have a feeling he was saying that to Judah going, take the money, take fruit, take gifts. And he probably wanted to go, okay, now go, go. But instead in verse 18, he says, take also your brother and arise and go again unto the man. He said, take him, man. <laughs> take Benjamin, take him. Take all this stuff and take Benjamin. See, this is where our patriarchs become our patriarchs in the Bible. <laughs> these guys are men of faith. The Bible talks about Jacob and our Israel and all these guys highly. But we read about all their, a lot of the times we're reading about their, their insufficiencies and their weaknesses, which I thank God for because they, that lets us know they're just men. So, so I like reading about their, their failures at times because I fail all the time. But here now we see a man who said, okay, I'm broken. Judah's calling me out. And he's right. And it's time. I got to give this up. This is what makes him a patriarch of the scripture. This is what makes him a man of faith. Someone who says, my son, who I love, if I lose him, then take him. If this is what we need to do. You and I have this opportunity daily. We do. We could still today say, Lord, okay, I hear you. Take it. Take, take it from me. I, I'm, I'm done holding on to this. I'm done, I'm done uh, uh, doing this that you don't want me to do. Take it from me. I remember the night the Lord spoke to me and said that I had all these idols in my life. My mind was one of them. My mind was an idol because I relied on it before I relied on the Lord. Uh, fantasizing, I think I share that with you guys, just kind of going another place. I usually try to distract myself and that was an idol. What's that going to do? Uh, for some of us, pornography is an idol because it's so distracting and it just kind of stimulates the flesh and we don't have to think about our reality. That's an idol. All of these things are just things that we run to in place of the Lord. And he's saying to every one of us, if you have that in your life tonight, if there's something you're doing in place of me because you're trying to remedy a situation in your life, you need to give it up right now. You need to surrender it. You need to let it go. Because if you're not, it's going to take you down. Who wants to be taken down, man? Come on, seriously. Who wants to be flattened by the Lord? I don't want to be. I mean, come on. You know what I mean? What's the fun in that? Do you think, what, what, what is that? So he says, take them. And look what he says here in verse 14. And God Almighty, and now he's, here he goes preaching now. See? Once you, once you deliver yourself, once you, once you set this free, your perspective begins to clear up a little bit. Okay? And God Almighty give you mercy before the man. Yeah, amen. That he may send away your other brother and Benjamin. Yeah, he's believing God for great things. If I be bereaved of my children, then I be bereaved. <laughs> See that? Look, man, all I can do at this point is what he's saying is pray. So here you go. God, this is what you want. Take it. Lord, you have to, you're in control now. You be merciful, Lord, if you want to be merciful. If you're going to deliver that which I feel is important to me, then deliver. It's up to you, Lord. But if I'm bereaved, then I'm bereaved. That's it. You know, guys, we got to get to a point where your plans and your contingencies about life are things that you're able to surrender to God. And, you know, for, for you single guys, if you die single, then you die single. Whatever, Lord. If you're not going to bring me my Cinderella or whatever little feet, then whatever. If you're married and, 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 
and your, your, your wife is there, you guys might struggle here and there, or whatever. Guess what? Lord, if, if this is my wife, then this is my wife. That's, that's what I'm going to do. If she's funky and crazy and weird looking at times, and then you know what? That's it. Lord, if this is my job, this lousy, good for nothing, stinky job, then this is my job. Lord, if this is the state I got to live in, then this is the state I got to live in. <laughs> Even though I can't buy a house or whatever, whatever. You know, I hate this state. Uh, whatever. We got to just come to the Lord eventually and say, if I'm bereaved, then I'm bereaved. <laughs> That's it. Because isn't that what God wants? For us to get to a place to say, whatever happens with me in this life, then is whatever happens to me. Job was a wise man. And Job came to the, con the conclusion, naked I come into this world, naked go I. That's it. That's the summation of everything. I came into this world naked, I'm going to leave naked. We have to come to this place in our spiritual walk, guys, where we say, Lord, then your will be done. Your will be done. Yeah, I may not feel good. I may not like it. Some of you have prodigal children. Pray. You just pray. Some of you, the wives are struggling. Your marriage is struggling. Some of you have gone through some serious trial in the last few years. And you don't see a way out. Right now, you may not see it. But let yourself say, if then this is the thing that God has allowed for me, then this is what he's allowed for me. That's it. And so, verse 15. The men took the present, and they took the double money in their hand, and Benjamin, and they rose up and went down to Egypt, and they stood before Joseph. So sometimes we see that the only way of having a breaking point is to be brought to the edge of defeat. But now we see in our reading a shift in the wind, a change in the page. For now, they're standing face to face unknowingly to them to their lost brother. <laughs> For now, God's plan of revealing to them what he's actually been doing and why everything has happened in their lives is standing right in front of them. Can you imagine that? All of their regret, regrets we've been reading about, all of their frustration and anger and bitterness and hurt, everything they have been going through, finding no way to be delivered from it. They haven't been able to deliver themselves from it. They haven't been able to, to come to some reasonable solution to find peace about what they did. But now that peace, the answers, the understanding, everything is now right in front of them because he broke and he came to the edge of defeat and he allowed for God to be in control. Let God deliver you the same way. Let him blow your mind again. Let him take from you that which you're holding to, so that way you could be standing right in front of your answer. That which is going to deliver you and bring you peace and bring you closure and bring you understanding. Let God do this for you too. But you have to break yourself, man. You have to give it up. You have to stop what you're doing. You have to trust God again and believe on him for big things. Your faith, he wants to stir it up again. He wants to move in your life. And then he wants you to say, man, I forgot that God is actually that real. Like I used to know him to be. When I first got saved, man, I was worshiping and experiencing the goodness of God. I, I got out of the gutter. I got a job. I got changed. I became a different person. Oh, I remember that so good. And that was such a good time. Well, guess what? God wants to be that God to you again and all the time. But the only thing that stands in the way is you and your idols and the things that you rely on today to remedy your situation. Trust in God. He's going to appear again, you know. 
And the Bible, in fact, tells us he's going to come back for every one of us. And I love the left behind, the old school one, the thief in the night. That weird, scary song in the beginning by, what's his name, Norman, whatever. Huh? <laughs> yeah, the long-haired dude. Uh, but you remember the scene where the pastor was in the, in the church and the rapture and there's the pastor and they're crying or whatever. Hey, man, that's true. <laughs> there's going to be a lot of Christians left behind in there. <laughs> left with your own remedies that you've been using this whole time. Left with all these things that you've been doing to sustain your walk with God. You'll be left with those too. You see what I'm saying? And that day, unfortunately, and I pray no man in this room is left behind, of course. But if you are, <laughs> if you might be one of those that might be sitting in the fellowship on a Thursday night by yourself, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm going to assure you this much right now. You'll be sitting here in the fellowship hall by yourself with the same resources you're using today to remedy your life. If the resource is not Jesus, of course. So, man, I pray, Lord, bring us to our Joseph. Bring us to where Jesus now is standing in front of us. And we got past all the muck and the mire. We got past all the drama and the fog. And we got past all the, all the self-remedies. And we got past all the, 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 the idols and the, the weird stuff. And now we see him again. Standing in his, in his glory. Wanting to just be there with you. Be your friend. To fellowship with God. When's the last time you fellowshiped with God? True fellowship. True fellowship. When's the last time you fellowship with him? When you were just open, you were, you were blank, and it was just you and him. Or is it you and him and your pill and your NyQuil and your drink and the da 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 and the TV and all this other stuff? You, you'll be left behind with your pill and your NyQuil. And everything. You'll be sitting here with your NyQuil and, your, and everything else you got. Guys, this is real. Don't, don't play games. What for? It ends in destruction. You know that? It ends in destruction. Let him deliver you tonight. Let him set you free from yourself again. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. So Jesus, we thank you for standing here with us tonight. For showing us, Lord, your glory. Showing us your desire to deliver us, to set us free from our idols, to set us free from that which we're using to understand our life. Let us have tonight in our own minds spiritually, let us have a, a, a campfire where we're throwing everything in and just burning it. And that way, Lord, we have nothing that's standing in between the gap. That you are the only one your presence is all we need because let us believe that there's nothing that the presence of Christ cannot cure. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.